I've been a friend of your pastor's now for 10 years, as he reminded me, and I think we're both getting old. Uh, I can't imagine knowing somebody for 10 years, but here we are. Uh, but I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to preach God's Word. Um, I find myself in no other peace, no better peace in my life than when I'm able to stand and preach His Word. Um, so a tiny bit about me. Uh, I'm married to a beautiful woman named Megan. We've been married for about five years now. We live in Rembert, South Carolina. And uh, if you know where that is, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, there's not much to it. It's a tiny little place. and I'm a, I'm a chaplain uh, for hospice. By, by trade, and uh, I'm grateful to be here today. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to read a good bit of Scripture today, but uh, it never hurt anybody to read a lot of Bible. Nehemiah chapter 1, the Bible says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa the citadel that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down, and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and in its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the walls of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for. I asked I ask for the good hand of my God was upon me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for another day. God, we know that you orchestrate all things. And you have given us this day, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I praise you for another opportunity to preach your word. I thank you for the people that are here tonight. I pray for each one of them, Lord. You know their needs. 
But Lord, I pray as I preach your word, Lord, that every word out of my mouth, God, would be yours and not mine. And Lord, if there's any word in my mouth that comes out as mine, God, I pray that it would fall to the ground and die. Lord, we love you tonight, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of y'all have ever heard of John Knox? John Knox was one of the founders of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And he was very ill, um, and he began to die. And he asked his wife, he said, Read me that scripture where I first cast my anchor. And after he listened to the beautiful prayer of Jesus recorded in John 17, it's recorded he seemed to forget his weakness. He began to pray, interceding earnestly for his fellow men. He prayed for the ungodly who had rejected the gospel. He pleaded on behalf of people who had been recently converted and requested protection for the Lord's servants, many of whom were experiencing persecution. As Knox prayed, his spirit went home to be with the Lord. The man of whom Queen Mary had said, I fear his prayer more than I do the armies of my enemies. John Knox ministered through prayer until the very moment of his death. What an example for us to look at in our modern world. We're going to talk about prayer today. And there's five things that I want to look at here in Nehemiah's prayer and the first part of him being sent to Judah. The first thing that I think we must recognize is the reverence of his prayer. Nehemiah hears the problem and immediately goes into a time of weeping and mourning for days. This hit me so hard when I was preparing for this. Oftentimes when I prepare to preach, I preach to myself really hard first. When's the last time we allowed an object of prayer to affect us this way? We see Nehemiah here wept and mourned for days and fasted over the issues that he saw here, the burden that he had for Jerusalem and that he needed to go and fix it. When's the last time we stopped and prayed for the people in our lives, our church, our nation and its leaders, our jobs, our co-workers, I used to work in, a, in the Department of Corrections in South Carolina. It's probably the worst job I've ever had. Um, if you couldn't tell, uh, it's an awful, awful place to work. And I, I got to work one day, and this coworker had gotten on my nerves. And I went over there to another coworker, and all I was doing was complaining. I said, man, I cannot stand the way that he's treating us. It's not fair. It's disrespectful. It's this and that. And that coworker turned to me, and Bob said, have you prayed for him? And boy, that hit me, you know. Have I prayed for him today? No. (laughs) All I wanted to do was complain. Yet I think it shows us in Scripture that we need to be praying for our co-workers, our enemies, our nation, and its leaders. Many people often find themselves in a place where it's much easier to complain than pray. But prayer is always the answer, and that's what Scripture shows us here. Nehemiah positions his heart to God, recognizing the severity and the reverence of what he is about to do. I think that reverence is something that we've certainly lost in the culture that we live in. I don't think people quite respect the Lord like they used to. And it's getting worse every day in our society. And all we can do as God's people is continue to pray. We live in a world of fast blessings over food as a prayer life. Let that sink in. The God of heaven who created us and sustains us every day. And so many people in the world that we live in think that it's acceptable to bow your head and just say, thank you, Lord, for the food. And that's the only prayer life they ever have. That's not what we see in the example of Scripture. That's not what we see in Nehemiah's example. He recognizes the reverence of prayer. The second thing, going into verse 4 and 5, we must recognize the recipient of our prayers. Verse 4 says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down, wept, and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. See, see the language that Nehemiah uses here. 
we see great and awesome God, covenant keeper, and God of steadfast love of those who keep His commandments. We serve a God that made a way through Jesus Christ for us to have a relationship with Him. And I pray that each and every one of you desire to take that relationship seriously. There was a young man that lived with my family for some time when I was younger. He was an Iraq war veteran. He served with my father. And he became a drug addict terribly when they came back from the war. He was 17 when they went over there. And the things that he had to see and that he talked about were absolutely horrific. And he was homeless and, uh, you know, on drugs. And he called my dad one evening and he said, I have no place to go. And my dad said, you will come and you will live with me, but you have to stay sober and you have to try to live a good life. And I was sitting in the yard talking to Brandon one day. And I said, Brandon, have you prayed about your addiction? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, I prayed one time. God didn't give me what I needed, so I gave up. And that has stuck for me for the rest of my life, and it will stick for the rest of my life. That his whole idea of prayer was I asked God for something one time, he didn't do it, so now I gave up. And I pray for him every day. He had an overdose probably six months ago, and uh, he's now back in rehab trying to recover from that. So when you think about it, pray for Brandon. But we live in an Amazon Prime generation we live in a generation now where people desire to click on something and have it at your front door in an instant. And people try to treat God that way. People try to treat God in the manner of, I'm going to click on, on this prayer and I want it now. And that's not what we see in Scripture. And that's not the example of what we have. People don't have reverence anymore. And they don't understand the recipient of their prayers. There's a story about a DNR officer in Texas and he went to this ranch, this 150-acre this ranch in the middle of Texas. And he told him, he said, I'm here for an inspection of your ranch. And the farmer said, yes, sir. He said, all 150 acres are yours. You go to see whatever you want to see. He said, but those two acres over there, don't, don't go over there. He said, there's, there's a reason behind it. Don't go over there. And so the man went and was completing his inspection. And all of a sudden... Uh, you know, the man comes back to the farmer and he says, I'm going to go inspect that two acres. The farmer said, I don't think I would do that. And the man pulled out his badge and he said, you see this badge? He said, do you know who I am? He said, I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm DNR in the state of Texas. I can go anywhere I want to go. And he put the badge up and he walked over the two acres and the farmer went over and sat on the porch, got him a glass of tea, and here comes the DNR officer running by the porch with a bull chasing him. And he started screaming at the farmer, Hey, help me, help me, help me. Farmer said, Show him the badge. Show him your badge. The DNR officer didn't recognize who he was talking to. He didn't understand that there was a reason behind what was being told here. He didn't recognize the reverence of the two acres. The third thing that we see here is that we must recognize the reality of prayer and who we are. Verse 6 and 7, Nehemiah goes into talking about the confession for the people, for the sins of the people of Israel. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He understood who he was. And I think everybody must understand who we are as a people when we go to God. We have to understand that we're sinners. There's no good in us outside of Christ Jesus. Isaiah 64, 6 says we have polluted garment righteousness. The old King James refers to it as filthy rags. It says we have iniquities like the wind that take us away. We have to recognize that we are sinners standing in need not only of salvation, which is the immediate need, but sustenance every single day. Nehemiah understood his corruption and his inability to keep the law. And he understood that his people did the same and he interceded for his people. I think as a church body that we need to be doing this. 
we need to be confessing our sins to God, confessing to one another, and praying for one another every single day. Number four, Nehemiah recognizes the reputation of the Word of God. Verse 8 through 10, he says, Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. He's referring back to Scripture here. We serve an everlasting God of goodness, never failing and never going back on His word or His promises. Nehemiah pulls that out and pulls Scripture into his prayer and says, But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Remember, Lord, your word. We are servants redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. And lastly here, Nehemiah recognizes the responsibility that he has to take action. First, he recognizes the situation. Even as early as verse 3, they said to him, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. He recognized the situation. He recognized who he was, recognized who God was, what God's word had to say about it. And finally, the responsibility to take action on what he has asked and prayed for. So Nehemiah goes to the king in the king's presence. And the king immediately notices that there is a change in Nehemiah, physical change. He allowed the burden that God sent to him to physically change his countenance. It's been a long time in my life since I've let a burden do that. And I think I need to get back to that more and more. Nehemiah had already been in prayer for this beforehand. Says So we see him praying in verse 4 through 11. And then he goes before the king. Says, now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king says, why is your face sad seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was very much afraid. And I said, let the king live forever. Why should not be my face sad? When the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah had already been in prayer before this situation, but he also took time in the middle of the situation to pray. And I think that's important because we, as, as Christians in our daily lives, can take advantage of this. In the middle of hard meetings, in the middle of hard conversations with friends, with family, we can take advantage of saying, hey, give me just a second, and asking God to help us and guide us through the conversation. And that's what Nehemiah does here in front of the king. He also prays directly in the middle of the situation, and his request is granted. Now, if you've read the book of Nehemiah, he then goes. He prays. He preloads everything he does with prayer. And then when he is granted by the king permission to go and do what he's prayed for, he does it. And I think that is something that we need to follow as an example. When we pray for something and we get it, we need to praise God for that. And we also need to take action. We must follow the example of Nehemiah in our prayer lives and our daily lives every day. To those of you in here, as I close, who have accepted Christ, pray every day. Every single time you have an opportunity, pray and, and, and develop that relationship with God. To those of you in here who may not be believers, we, as believers, 
like John Knox, need to be praying for them. And they need to be taught to approach the Lord as Nehemiah did, ultimately in a context of salvation. Who are you? Who is He? And take action in your prayer life starting today. Let your burdens affect you and don't blow them off. And remember, sometimes when you take your burden to the Lord, you may be the solution. I think that's the hardest thing I've ever, hardest conclusion I've ever come to. Sometimes you go to the Lord in prayer, and especially at our church, and I feel like people go to the altar and they pray and they say, Lord, we need this. We need this. And Lord, I, I just pray that Brother Monty would do that for us. I just pray that somebody else would do that. Lord, we need somebody to fix this or sweep the floor or do this. I, I really hope, Lord, you send somebody to do that when really they're the, you're the solution yourself. Oftentimes I've been guilty of that in my life. And the convicting words of the Lord in Nehemiah really change your perspective. But I thank you for an opportunity to preach God's Word. And let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for another opportunity to preach your word. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, you've given us a guide to live our lives. It's your holy word. Lord, may we never be irreverent towards your word, towards who you are. And God, may we all develop the prayer life that you would desire us to have. Lord, you sent Jesus so that we may have access, so that we may have a prayer life. And God, I pray that you would just continue to develop that in each and every one of us today. Lord, as we leave from this place, I pray that you would just keep every one of us happy and healthy and safe. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.